Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to session number three where we are looking at dua number three. Mm -hmm. And this dua is Allahumma rabba shahri Ramadan. And actually it's not a very long dua, right? It's a very no, short one. A, we call it the third short dua, don't we? <laughs> the third short dua, right. Um, and for this one, we thought we'd focus on one of the questions in the book. So if you have your book, yeah. um, there is a question over there that says there are three main requests in the dua. And what is the first request that is asked for? So shall we read through this dua? Since yeah, let's do short. that. Yeah, let's do that. I have my copy here as well. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Sharnati. Um, Allahumma Rabba Shahri Ramadan. O oh Allah, Lord of the month of Ramadan, in which you sent down the Quran and made fasting obligatory on your servants, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, and enable me to go for pilgrimage in the sacred house in this year and every year, and forgive me those great sins I carry. For surely none can forgive them except you, O possessor of majesty and honor. So the typical du'as that we would spot here are enable me to go for Hajj and forgive me my sins. But there's one before that, isn't there? Well, those are the two I picked up immediately. And then I scanned back. And actually the first du'a that we make is وَسَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى مُحَمَّدْ and bless, the, and bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Yes. So the salawat is actually our first dua that we are making within this dua. Okay. And often we forget that salawat is actually a dua because we are asking, we are asking Allah to do this for our Holy Prophet and his family. But we never yeah. tend to think of it as a dua, do we? Mm -hmm. We are always mm -hmm. told, you know, like sandwich your own duas with a salawat at the beginning yeah. and salawat at the end. So we just think it's a preliminary thing mm -hmm. as opposed to the dua itself. But here we are being told that actually no, sending blessings is in its own right a, a, a supplication that we make. And you were saying how it's a supplication with no side effects. Yes. It's a supplication that is always accepted. Yeah. which is why we are told to have our salawat first and then to add our own personal dua and then a salawat at the end because the first two duas are going to be accepted. Allah will not leave the dua in the middle. Yeah. And, and we're, you know, we're recommended to recite <coughs> so many supplications like we have dua kumel and dua, you know, even in Ramadan, dua iftita, but in, even in general, we're told so many duas. Um, but here is one dua that it's so short, so easy to be recited. But yet I feel like we're quite lazy in reciting it, aren't we? And I like it that this dua has the salawat in the middle. So it's actually part of the dua. It is, you know, yeah. we've got the salawat at the beginning that we would recite generally salawat at the end, but this is actually a salawat as part of the dua, yeah. which, is, which is different, isn't it? So why do you think we are so lazy in reciting it, Fatima? Auntie? Like, you know, we're told, for example, if the prophet's name is mentioned or if the imam's names are mentioned, then we should recite salawat. But generally, it's like, oh, well, actually, I don't need to recite it. That's just, or well, it's become very ritualistic. And we don't actually even think about what we're reciting. We, even we, mumble, it. we mumble it. We just say it. You yeah. know? We don't yeah. say it loudly enough when we do. So I came across two things <clears throat> that would maybe give us a huge incentive. So um, when you recite Salawat on the Holy Prophet and his family, a thousand angels, Allah sends down a thousand blessings to you, first of all. And wow. then a thousand angels are appointed, appointed to send blessings to you as well. So you can imagine one salawat that we are sending, asking Allah to send blessings on the Holy Prophet and his family, but the return is for us is phenomenal, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's just the beginning, isn't it? There's like tons and tons. What was the second benefit you were going to so mention? The other one that I was really excited about is that it says it's the weightiest thing on your scale. Mm, so can wow. you imagine, you know, all the ziyarats, all the hajj, that is not mentioned. A salawat is mentioned as the weightiest thing. You know, wow. that's absolutely ama amazing. That thing we take so much for granted and so lazy and, and we so think, oh, you know, who can be bothered? Yeah. Actually, it's the weightiest thing. One yeah. 10 second salawat. Subhanallah. Yeah. There, actually, it's quite, it has a lot more benefits as well, doesn't it? Like, we are told that if we recite salawat, then when we are in our grave, it will light up our grave. Mm -hmm. um, or when we are risen on the day of judgment, if we have been somebody who recites salawat, there will be nur emanating. And it actually specifies the body parts like nur emanating from our face, nur emanating from our back, nur emanating from our right hand and our left hand. And I just think, wow, there's, there's so much to it. Um, 
That's incredible because on the day of judgment, you know, we are all going to be so worried about what our form is going to be, you know, what we're going to look like, how we're going to rise from our graves. And here we are told that a simple salawat mm. is going to guarantee a very pleasant appearance from us, you know. We were talking about this last, in the uh, last dua, weren't we, about um, mm. the clothing, the inner yeah. clothing and the shame that we will feel when we are exposed on the day of judgment. So you're mm. right. This is a perfect way to have, mm you know, light instead of shame. Yeah, yeah. It's also like, what I found really powerful was that there's so much that one salawat can do, it can completely erase our sins. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a hadith that says, whoever is seeking to have his sins forgiven should send blessings on the prophet and his family as it destroys sins completely. Now, mm -hmm. when we were talking about sins, weren't we? We were saying that sometimes we get a bit complacent and you know, when it comes to Laylatul Qadr or 15 Shaban, we're like, actually, I can't really think of many sins to yeah. write down. You know, sure. I've been praying and I've been yeah. fasting and all the rest of it. Um, but sometimes sins don't have to be big. We pick yeah. up a lot of small sins along the way, which we don't even realize. The negligence, like neglecting things, yeah. you know, yeah. the things we overlook, the asraf, the, you know, the lack of moderation, though that can all be considered as a sin if it's, if it's going across, you know, against the, against the bounds. Yeah. Wasting time, yeah. not being, not using this gift of time that we have to the best of our ability, scrolling yeah. instead or you know, all the rest of it. Those are little things that actually can add up. And reciting salawat not only forgives those sins, but actually can help remind us of what our purpose is and, and, and like realign us to the bigger purpose. And I think this one is one I need as well. A salawat is really good to develop memory. Mm. So again, just we all want a good memory. Yeah. Even three salawats, you know, in the morning or after every, after every salat or like, you know, before you start your work, you know, as you get older, like, you know, exams, you know, the, the sheer amount of information we need to remember, it just, yeah. it helps and it's, it's, it's real. It's, it's an easy thing to do. The trick is, Fatimanti, now that we know the benefits, how can we implement this into our life and make it a habit? And we were saying that actually it doesn't have to be you know, hard, uh, it can be done at any time when we're, walk like you said, when you wake up in the morning, even when you're walking to school, um, mm -hmm. even if you get dropped off, you know, when you enter the car or you leave the car, if you just make these habits of reciting salawat when you, the, in the transitions or yeah. anything like that. And there was an app you mentioned that's helpful, isn't it? Yeah, there's, a sh there's one that's called Shia Plus mm -hmm. and um, it's quite good in that um, every day it gives you a list and you can amend the list to what you want to add. Mm -hmm. And every time you do that act, so it would, might say, you know, three salawats or 10 tasbihat arba, one surah fatiha, and you tick it, you press it. And once you've done it, you tick it. And then it tells you how many, you know, how many you've completed out of your list in a day. Mm -hmm. And then it also tells you how much of a streak you've had. So how many days in a row you've been doing it for. So it's quite, you know, it motivates you and it's, it's good to have it there and, you know, so you don't forget. So just little things like that. I think we've got to really personalize it and see what works for you. And you can start off small, right? You can start yeah. off with like making sure you just recite at least 10 salawat a day and mm -hmm. then build it up the more you start remembering it. Because I think when we're building habits, mm -hmm. having that reminder from the app would be really good. Yeah, right. And also the accountability. Yeah, so you know, at the end of the day, if you have to complete the app and oh, I can just recite 10 salawat now, at least yeah. that's done before you go to sleep. Yeah, it's quite satisfying to be able to tick it and see yeah. that tick come up. And then at the end, it tells you like how many percentage of what you would, we would want to complete, you have completed. Okay. So you, if you haven't managed to do your 10 ayats of Quran, then you're at 90% or like, you know, like, so it, it gives you that as well. Yeah, it's a good one. Sounds like a good app to get. Yeah, yeah. So inshallah, we all become of those people who are salawat reciters. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we'll see all, all these people around moving their lips when they're walking to and fro and we know what they're doing, inshallah, reciting salawats. Yeah, inshallah. And then there's a, a question here, isn't there, based on the dua, where it says, and enable me to go to pilgrimage, for pilgrimage to your sacred house in this year and in every year. And the question was, why do you think going for Hajj is so important that we ask to be given the chance to go every year? There must be quite a lot to it. It is. I mean, first of all, we know that the Aima used to go as often as they could. So we know that this is a practice that they did. And then, you know, the emphasis on that it is such a unique journey. It's actually allowing you to, you know, wipe out all your sins. I think, you know, that 
the hadith about the night at Arafah, when you are, you know, after that you are, a, you are actually born again as if it's a completely clean slate. Mm. And then the, the benefits, it's just, you know, it spiritually boosts you in a time when, you know, every year there are so many pitfalls in life, you know, you're facing so many disadvantages and you know shaitan is always there and this is a time to, to sort of regenerate yourself yeah. and you know boost your spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you know ask for forgiveness of your sins so it's something that it's an opportunity that if you can then you would wouldn't you yeah absolutely and there are quite a lot of narrations as well right there was a man who came to one of the imams I, it, I, it doesn't specify which one and he says I want to go every year. Is that okay? And the imam says, I give you glad tidings. You know, you will have risk and wealth and children. And basically, you know, so many blessings and benefits will come from that. And then the flip side of that we found was that a hadith that if you can go, if you can afford to go, and you do not go once every four to five years, then it's actually mukuru not to go. Yeah. So that's very strong, isn't it? It's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And the other reason like we should go and realign ourselves is because the Imam is of our time is making that trip too. Like we know he is going for Hajj at the same time we are and we are doing these actions in his vicinity, right? Just like we're told to pray on time because Imam is also praying on time. So it's as if we're praying behind the Imam. We are told to go for Hajj because our Imam is there and we attain that closeness to him and to the Ahlul Bayt in general. So that is quite that quite a strong statement as well. We go for our wilaya. And then the question of, well, should we go every year or should we facilitate, you know, somebody else going or should we give that money elsewhere? What do you think? What did we what did you come up with that? So there are some differences uh, in the scholarly opinion on this. So Ayatollah Sistani says that actually it's better to go yourself. Uh, the only exception for maybe that, you know, if you see a family in front of you that's struggling, you know somebody that's struggling to survive. Um, and, you know, if you, while you're going on Hajj, then maybe you can give them that money instead to help them. But in general, um, it is better to go like there's a lot of emphasis on going yourself. And, and I think the point to remember is that Hajj is only wajib when you can afford it. Yes. And actually, it's not recommended to go on Hajj by taking a loan. It has to be something that you earn or you have them enough money for your, you know, to cover, uh, as opposed to needing to pay someone back for that. Um, so that's it from us for Dua number three. Thank you very much. Um, and do, you know, try out the Kahoot quiz and the activity suggested. There are really, a couple of uh, really cool experiments that you can try out. And if you do try them out, do take a picture and tag us in social media. We'd love to know whether you tried it. Otherwise, take care, inshallah, and see you next time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon.